Okay, so we'll start with you, Michael. Okay. We're looking at a T2 axial uh, MRI. Um, there's a large um, heterogeneous heterogeneously hyperintense uh, lesion, I think centered in the right masticator, uh, transpatial, uh, but centered in the right masticator space. Uh, I think- um, well, What is the masticator space at this level? <clears throat> What's this? Um, that's the mand uh, mandible. Mandible, condylar head. So what's that guy? These are the uh, pterygoid plates and from the lateral pterygoid plate to the condylar yeah. neck is this muscle. Yes, yeah, the lateral pterygoid muscle. The lateral pterygoid. So that's the masticator space around there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So what's this guy? So that's the uh, mandible on the right side. This is the mandible, right? What is this muscle that goes over here to the lateral, lateral pterygoid? Lateral pterygoid. So is this centered in the no, masticator no. space? No, no, it's, it's, it's causing, it's convex out causing mass effect on the uh, uh, masticator space. So it's pushing the masticator space yeah. out laterally, but it's not centered in the masticator space. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So what, uh, what level are we at kind of up here? Um, you know what this bump is? Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, where the uh, torus tuberius. Um, torus tuberius is that bump, right. So behind the torus tuberius is this, what is that? Eustachian tube. <clears throat> no, what's oh. behind the torus tuberius? There is a recess of the pharynx that goes out oh. laterally. Yeah, Rosa, Fossa Rosenmuller. Fossa Rosenmuller, if you like to name stuff after dead people, that's the lateral pharyngeal recess that goes laterally. The eustachian tube is in front of it. Now, if I find my condylar head and I find the medial part of it, I go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, what's right there? Um, uh, uh, fossil valley. Uh, what goes through a valley? We're below the scope uh, place here. Oh, um, uh, V3. V3, so that, that is V3 right there. Okay, so what likes to happen at the bottom of the lateral pharyngeal recess or fossil Rosenmuller? What likes to originate there? Squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and what do we call squamous cell carcinoma of this part of the pharynx? Uh, nasopharyngeal. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma. We give it a different name because. Uh, it. it um... The treatment is different. We usually treat it with chemo and radiation. Surgery is really re reserved for bulky disease and recurrence. Mm -hmm. So, where is this centered? Uh, the right fossa uh, of uh, right um, uh, pharyngeal. It's centered near the bottom of the right lateral pharyngeal recess or fossa Rosenmuller. Okay. It's a big mass. It's pushing a lot of the stuff out of the way. And what do you think is going on with the skull base on this side compared to this side? Uh, it's involving the right skull base. Is that important? Yes. Why is that important? Uh, it'll make surgical resection tougher. It would, but we just said that nasopharyngeal carcinoma therapy is usually chemo and radiation. Yeah. Oh, it'll... Aging is important. If it invades the skull base, it's automatically a T3. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this compared to that? Uh, there's a right mastoid effusion. So if the right mastoid and middle ear are all opacified, where do you look next? Uh, at the four lymph nodes. Or, I'm uh, sorry, for uh, if the uh, right mastoid is opacified, um, uh, there's probably a blockage in the drainage, so it's probably involving the uh, eustachian tubes. Eustachian tube, and the eustachian tube opens uh, into the uh, torus tuberius. In, in front the... of the torus tuberius and the nasopharynx. Mm -hmm. So, anytime you see unilateral middle ear and mastoid fluid, the next thing you look at is the uh, 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 nasopharynx, the uh, lateral pharyngeal recess. Nasopharynx. Okay, so this is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, but what's in your differential? What other things might you consider? 
Um, so squamous cell carcinoma. That's um, the same thing. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma are the same thing. We give nasopharyngeal carcinomas a different name because we treat them differently. Mm -hmm. What else is in your differential though? Uh, adenoid cystic and muco, well, no. Uh, uh, so minor salivary gland carcinomas and lymphomas are other things you might consider. Mm -hmm. So mucoep, adenoid cystic, all those different types, right. So anytime you see unilateral middle ear and mastoid fluid, you look at the nasopharynx to see if you're mechanically blocking the eustachian tube. And this is a good appearance for the thing that's centered in the lateral pharyngeal recess at that site. Yeah. And, and again, um, Dr. Williams, the, what's the relationship of the uh, torus to of yeah the torus tuberius and the uh, lateral pharyngeal recess? The torus tuberius is that bump. So when you see the back of the nasal coena, you're at the nasal pharynx. So in front of it is nasal cavity, behind it is nasal pharynx. The bump is torus tuberius. In front of the bump is the opening eustachian tube, and behind it is the lateral pharyngeal recess. At the mm -hmm. bottom of the lateral pharyngeal recess, that's where nasopharyngeal carcinomas like to start. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Matthew. Thank you. Oh, Doctor, hey. a question: Was there a perineural um, tumor spread on the right, the the V five nerve, maybe? V five. So maybe maybe on V three, it's probably going up a valley. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, right to the clivus. On the right. This yeah. right here? Yeah. yeah. What no, foramen? Think about the other side. You're down low at the level of the medulla. So what foramen is that? Um, nine, 10, 11, 12. That hypoglossus already? Hypoglossus already. That's 12. That's right. You're at the level of the hypoglossal canal. You're kind of below the jugular foramen. So 12 is going through there, not five. But this is V3. If you find your condylar head and you go a centimeter medial and a centimeter anterior, that's V3. And this thing is yeah. centered near the bottom of the lateral pharyngeal recess. And it's hard to find V3 there, which goes up through a valley. So you might yeah, think right. about V3 perineural tumor spread on this case. So the 12th cranial nerve on the right side is not involved. Just no, that's V3. okay. You okay. still see good black line around the bone. And there is a uh, venous plexus that's around the hypoglossal at the canal. So this is actually okay. Okay, Matthew? Ready. Axial CT of the neck with contrast. We're looking at a very well circumscribed hypoattenuating lesion centered about the left carotid space, kind of in the expected location of the carotid body with splaying of the internal and external carotids possibly unless that potentially that could be the jugular vein or the jugular veins being- That's okay. the jug. That's probably ICA. That's probably ECA. Okay. But this is still some sort of lesion centered in the carotid space on the left. Right, it's centered in the space. My first thought is uh, this doesn't look like the classic paraganglioma of a carotid Why body not? tumor. Why not? One, it's not splaying the um, internal and external carotids. So the carotid body tumor, you expect to be centered here in between the ECA and the ICA, yes. right? <clears throat> but it is, um, it is what we think about is the carotid sheath or space, you're right, because it's, it's actually in yes. between the jug and the carotid vessels. I do, could this be a necrotic lymph node? I don't know if lymph nodes live in the carotid space, but. We think about I'm them kind of as associated right with the carotid sheath or space. So we see lymph nodes around that area. So what's, what's this guy? That is the SCM. Oh, no, this no, is um, the SMG. The submandibular gland yeah. is under the mandible. The SCM is way out here laterally. So there's this space mm -hmm. kind of between the platysma, the thin muscle that's uh, over your neck, and the submandibular gland, the SCM, we think about as the uh, parotid tail. So sometimes things do happen in that area. So we might think about parotid tail lesions down here, but this is between the jug and the carotid, it's splaying those vessels. So what is normally in the carotid sheath or space? All right, you've got, you got the vasculature. 
you have the internal external carotid arteries and the jugular vein. Right. You have some sympathetic nerves. Any other nerves? Um, the vagus. 10. What's before? I'm assuming there's some other ones. The vagus is the one I think of the most. What's before 10? Nine. What are the two guys after 10? 11 and 12. So basically so everything part of comes nine out of the 12 are all in the carotid sheath or space of the superhighway neck. Cool. All of those nerves, part of them are, are kind of around that area. And that makes sense, you know, especially 12, because 12 is specifically going to the SCN and going back to the trap. So parts yeah. of cranial nerves 9 through 12 all live in the superhighway neck carotid sheath or space. And what kind yeah, of so nerves? What's that? What kind of pathologies happen to nerves? You can have nerve sheath tumors. Like what? Paraganglioma, schwannoma are the two main ones. And what's the less main one? Neurofibroma. Neurofibroma. It turns out schwannomas and neurofibromas are often both dark on CT before contrast. After contrast, schwannomas usually enhance and they have intratumoral cysts. But interestingly, neurofibromas stay low density on CT after contrast. Paragangliomas usually have a lot of vasculature. We talk about the salt and pepper with those lesions. This is a lesion that's within the carotid sheath or space and it's very low density even after contrast with, with no flow voids within it and no intratumoral cysts. Okay, so this would be a neurofibroma. It's a great appearance for a neurofibroma. So we have a lesion in the neck. We're in the superhyoid neck. We think the lesion is centered in the carotid sheath or space. It's in between the carotid vessels and the jug. It's pretty homogeneous. The surrounding soft tissues are not very angry about this thing. And it's very low density, even contrast. So a nerve sheath tumor would be a great differential for this lesion, schwannoma or neurofibroma. Schwannoma is usually enhanced and they get intratumoral cysts when they get big enough but neurofibromas are often low density on CT, even after contrast. Both schwannomas and neurofibromas may be low density before contrast, but neurofibromas often stay low density after. So this is a good appearance for a nerve sheet tumor. We might have discussions about necrotic nodes. We might have discussions about branchial cleft cysts uh, that can rarely happen in this location. But this is a good appearance for a, a neurofibroma at that level. Good. What is the name of the paraganglioma, like the location of the paraganglioma that is not the carotid body tumor, but is like still in the neck? Uh, so we have a bunch. <clears throat> they can happen anywhere. Very rarely, you might even see them in the uh, larynx. But if it's at the carotid body uh, space, we call that a carotid body tumor. If yeah. we think about where the skull base <clears throat> is and where we talked about the bird the other day, if it's centered two centimeters below the skull base, we call that a glomus vagali. If it's centered at the jugular foramen, we call it a jugular paraganglioma. If it's centered on the cochlear promontory in the middle air cavity, we call that a glomus tympanicum. Okay. So they can happen in different places. All of those are paragangliomas. So glomus tympanicum, jugular paraganglioma, the glomus vagali, and the carotid body tumor. And they can happen at other places. Every now and then, we rarely see one that's in the larynx. And the vagali, is that anywhere along the carotid sheath? just not at the skull base and that, not that, at the actual like bifurcation? This mass. What? Exact same as this mass. It'll be okay. in between the carotid and the jug. So Got the it. Spigali is centered two centimeters below the skull base, but usually we talk about salt and pepper with those lesions when yeah. they come in. Okay, thank you very much. That's useful. Okay, good. Grace? All right, ready. Um, so um, here we have a T1 post-contrast um, axial slice centered um, at the temporal lobes and slash phenoid sinus. There is a um, well circumscribed lesion um, medial to the um, right temporal lobe um, and lateral to the sphenoid sinus. Um, it looks like it's, I don't have a T1 free, but I would say it's either, it looks like it's um, heterogeneously enhancing um, and the surrounding brain tissue does not seem very, uh, did very angry that it's there. So 
Um, so I, I think something I think about at this location is like a aneurysm. Um, I don't see like a dural tail for me to think that this is definitely extraaxial, like but definitely like a meningioma, but that would be something I would also think, I'll think about as well. Did I, did I forget to unmute again? Okay, I'm good. Sorry. No. I just, so what's I your full differential? That. <laughs> what's that? What's your final differential? Um, I'm thinking it's either, I think I'm thinking most likely like an aneurysm potentially arising from the MCA. So where's this thing centered? It is centered. Um, oh, um, well, it's centered just uh, like in the cavernous sinus. So would this be a carotid aneurysm? So it, it, this is an ICA aneurysm, and, and there's a little bit of that chatter artifact that we see in the phase encoding direction. But we always talk about the differential for things. So we can have schwannomas here. We have nerve sheet tumors. We have meningiomas that may happen. And if this if they have pain and they look infectious inflammatory, we might think about an infectious mm -hmm. process. So we, you know, we have that differential that we still kind of go through, like we talked about IOID yesterday. Yep. Right? Yep. So this, this is an aneurysm. Uh, in that case, but we, we want to have that discussion and think about what is normally at that location and then what pathology happens to that anatomy, right? Yep. Okay, good. Let's see. Uh, April. Okay. So we have um, two images through the CPA. Um, I think they are T1 uh, non-contrast enhanced images, both probably just at different places. Right. We have a um, predominantly isodense to brain lesion that is expanding the internal auditory canal with some intrinsic T1 intensity there um, uh, in it. I'm wondering if this is my top diagnosis for this would be a, um, a vestibular schwannoma. Um, and so what do you think be... about that signal intensity? Yeah, so intrinsically T, so intrinsic T1 could be um, blood, could be. Um, well, is that a common thing with a vestibular schwannoma? Um, no, but vestibular schwannomas are very common. So you could have- um, So this guy does have sensory hearing loss. Yes. You still think vestibular schwannoma is the most common yes. thing here? Yes, I do think. Yeah, if a patient has sensory hearing loss and they show up with a lesion of the CP angle, 90% of the time, it's a vestibular schwannoma. It doesn't yeah. matter what it looks like. It has big cysts, it has blood. I don't care. Statistically, it's most likely a vestibular schwannoma, right? Yeah. So the nose is dark, as you said, in this case. So this is actually a blood in a vestibular schwannoma. You don't normally see that, but it is more common to see an atypical presentation of a common entity than it is to see an, an uncommon entity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Thank you. So that's, that's one of the things we want to remember here with these cases. Good. Okay, Christian? Uh, Dr. Wiggins, sorry, just going back to something you said before, um, you were talking about a differential IOID for um, the case- uh, Idiopathic right? orbital inflammatory disease or pseudotumor. Mm, okay. If you have pseudotumor in the cavernous sinus, if you like to name stuff after dead people, people call that Toulouse Hunt. Have you okay. heard that before? Yeah, yeah. A low grade idiopathic inflammatory infectious process in the cavernous sinus, we sometimes call Toulouse Hunt, mm -hmm. if you like to name stuff after dead people. Okay. Yeah. Christian? All right, ready. So I'm looking at a actual T1. I see a, it looks like a round mass centered in the right carotid space. Right. It has increased signal peripherally and it's dark in the center. Right. So it's quite large. It does, um, yeah, differentials is um, a glomus um, and a sheath tumor. It doesn't have the salt and pepper, even though it's T1, but maybe that's the nerve tumor and has some cystic degeneration in the middle. 
What kind of nerve sheet tumor? A schwannoma or a neurofibroma? Schwannoma. Neurofibromas on MR after contrast, strangely, they often have this weird target sign where you see a little circle on the inside and then kind of a lesion around the outside of it. Anything else in your differential? What if I told you this was actually in the coming from the deep lobe of the parotid? Would you believe that? Then I would look for deviation of the posterior belly of the digastric. Um, and what does the posterior belly digastric tell you? It depends on when it is, I think, deviated medially, then it might come from the no, I take that back. If it's deviated laterally, then it's probably not coming from the parotid, but from a space more medial to the parotid space. Um, it might come, yeah, it's continuous with the parotid. I see. Yeah, it, it could be a, a benign mixed tumor. They can be large and heterogeneous in signal intensity. Uh, so we did a T2 on this and it's dark on T2. Is that good for benign mixed tumor? It's just homogeneously dark. It's kind of iso like muscle and dark. Is that good for a benign mixed tumor? Not, no. No, they are usually heterogeneous. So benign mixed tumors are usually what on T2? They have some areas that are iso, iso uh, hyper intense. They're very bright. They're as bright as light bulbs. It's like as bright as CSF. Like this one, maybe. Yeah. So this was the poster belly. It was actually going around. This was actually the jug back here. And these were the carotid vessels. So you are right. This is in the carotid sheath or space. We also find that parapharyngeal fat and see how it's displaced. If something's mm -hmm. arising from the deep lobe of the parotid, we think about that fat pushed medially. So you get this thin line of fat that goes around like this. But if it's in the carotid sheath or space, it's pushed anteriorly. Yeah. So this was a schwannoma. So that makes this what? Is cystic degeneration in the middle of a schwannoma? A cystic degeneration? The intratumoral cysts that we see. When schwannomas get big enough, they have intratumoral cysts. Yeah. And the surrounding soft tissues, is anybody angry about this or does nobody seem to care? They don't care. Nobody seems to care about this. Nobody's angry. We find the fat, it's pushed anteriorly. And we, we follow the carotid and the jug. We go up and down. We realize it's in that space. And we know the parts of cranial nerves nine through 12 are in the carotid sheath or space. So that makes us think about nerve sheath tumors that may happen there. And this is a big enhancing thing. It doesn't have flow voids and it looks like it has intratumoral cysts. So that's all good for schwannoma. Okay. Oh, this is a post-con. This is a post-contrasted, yeah. So this is enhancing and that's not enhancing. Okay. This is after contrast. Sure. How do I know if I don't see the nose? Because I don't see any contrast. So you're trying to look at the other stuff. The, the mucosa here of the soft palate is enhancing and there's some enhancement of the uh, tonsils that we see here. But okay. you know, it's, it's always different if you only have one image. If you had the whole case, it would be easier to see. All right. Okay, let's see, is Tyler on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Tyler? All right, so we are looking at coronal. I think these are post-contrast T1 images. Yep. Kind of diffuse, dural, thickening and enhancement. And then maybe an absent septipelucidum. Maybe just a slice. Um, but this would make me Suspicious for like an intracranial hypotension. The neurosurgeon thinks it's diffuse mess. He wants to go biopsy the dura. What do you think? Um, we could look at some other sequences and see uh, if there's like midbrain slumping or anything else that would uh, suggest that, but it's just so uniform. Yeah, it doesn't look good for dural mets. Because this is yeah, I would expect kind of those. uniform all over the place. It's the same thickness kind of on one side as the other. Is there any mm -hmm. clinical history you'd be interested in? Um, like a recent LP or uh, trying to think what else. 
that any weird thing that might be a CSF leak. That's right. See, she had an LP last week, and this is a great intracranial hypertension case with a very classic enhancement kind of all the way around the outside. Good, good job. Uh, let's see, so we're back to Michael. Uh, that's the Vidian canal. That's the Vidian or pterygoid canal. That's right. What goes through there? The Vidian nerve. Touche. What fibers make up the Vidian nerve? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, su superficial petrosal nerve. That's right. So we're, when we think about where the IC is and where seven comes in, there's a little labyrinthine segment that goes forward to the genicular ganglia, and then the tympanic segment goes back just under the lateral semicircular canal. The greater superficial petrosal nerve comes off of there, and it goes immediately lateral to what? Uh, ICA, internal carotid right. artery. And there's always a break in the bone in the carotid anteriorly and medially. And that's where the parasympathetic fibers from seven, the greater superficial patrosa, join the sympathetic fibers that come off of the carotid. You remember Horner syndrome? Yeah. Where people have conversations about preganglionic or postganglionic. Is there a fracture of the skull base or something like that? The sympathetic fibers from the carotid join the parasympathetic from seven, and together they form the long, thin, curvilinear pterygoid or vidian canal that goes forward to the what? Uh, the. Uh, uh... Uh, pterygopalatine fossa. The pterygopalatine oh. fossa. So there's the pterygoid or uh, vidian canal there. So we have parasympathetic fibers from seven and sympathetic fibers of the carotid. And what is superior and lateral to that? Uh, frame rotundum. Rotundum or canal rotundum. It's really a kind of a tube. What goes through there? V2. V2. That's right. Good job. Okay. Matthew? Ready. CT neck uh, with with contrast. I don't know if I see the finding or not, unless it, we're looking at the right. Hmm, is it the right submandibular gland with the sialolith and ductal dilation? Yes, not as exciting if you say it like that. So we have high density here on that side. Uh, and for some reason on the ABR, for example, they love to talk about submandibular uh, duct stone. So about 65% of them are supposed to be within the gland itself or within the proximal duct. And you may get interductal dilatation of those lesions. But remember, they can be seen anywhere along that course. So in the sublingual space, when we think about the oral cavity. So in the coronal plane, if you think about kind of where the mandible comes off on both sides, there's this bump on the inside of the mandible. Do you know what that is? This muscle comes off of that, it goes under it. It's the myohyoid attaches there. The but... myohyoid line, right, of the mandibles where the myohyoid comes off. So below that, we think about the submandibular space where the submandibular glands are on both sides. In the middle of it, up on top, you have the geniohyoid muscle that goes from the genu or turn of the mandible back to the hyoid. And then the genioglossus muscle that uh, comes up with the root of the tongue and the midline lingual septum. And you have the triangular sublingual spaces on both sides of that area. So the submandibular duct is going through the sublingual space where it comes up behind the mylohyoid. So you might see little stones way down anteriorly in what we think about as the floor mouth uh, that are actually ductal dilatation from the submandibular duct going up to that level. That's right, good job. Thank you, great breakdown. So those are the four big spaces. So what are the four big spaces of the oral cavity that we think about? Uh, I'm gonna to try to wing it. Sub, sublingual, submandibular, <laughs> and that's all I know off the top of my head. What did we just say is in the middle in between the two sublingual spaces? Uh, I, I'm having short-term memory issues. We all do. The root of the tongue is the part in the middle. 
So the geniohyoid muscle that goes from the genu back to the hyoid, and then the genioglossus fanning up and the midline lingual septum, we call that the root of the tongue. And okay. then the oral mucosal surface or space is you know, where squames arise from. So the gingival buccal sulcus, the gingival lingual sulcus, the floor of the mouth, you know, alveolar ridge, all of those areas that are mucosal lined on the inside of your buccinator, all those areas we think about as the oral mucosal surface or space. Okay. Okay. Great. You don't you don't use oral pharyngeal, you use oral mucosal. Well, what's the difference between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx? Oral pharynx is more posterior and lateral. Yeah, it's not in the tongue part, right? Okay. That's the base of the tongue or the lingual adenoidal tissue in the back. So that's a whole different part, right? If you think about the upper digestive tract where the hard palate is, then you have the nasal cavity up on top and the nasal pharynx back behind it. Where your tongue is, that part's all gonna be oral cavity, right? And you have the circumvenic papillae, those bumps that are in the back of the tongue. So the lingual adenoidal tissue behind it and the soft palate and that thing that hangs down in the back of your throat, that's all gonna count as oral pharynx. So oral pharyngeal mucosal surface is gonna be back here, but oral cavity mucosal surface or oral mucosal surface is gonna be up there, right? And then as those tubes come down, you have a separation here. So what, what is the tube in front and behind here below the hyoid? What are the two tubes under the oral pharynx? Submandibular ducts. Well, no, that submandibular duct we just said is part of the oral cavity. Oh. Below the oral pharynx. Oh, do you mean like tracheoesophagus or, or the larynx? Above and the... the trachea and the esophagus, right. So larynx and hypopharynx. The larynx and the hypopharynx. So nasopharynx, oral pharynx, hypopharynx. And in the front, you have nasal cavity, oral cavity, larynx. And what separates the larynx and the trachea and the hypopharynx and the esophagus? It's, is it the epiglottis? No, the epiglottis is way up here. Um, uh, the, ooh, the cri cricoid? That's right, the cricoid. How, what is the cricoid shape like? A uh, signet ring. Signet ring shape, big and back, small in front. The bottom of the cricoid separates the larynx and the trachea and the hypopharynx and the esophagus. So the larynx is made up of this cartilaginous framework. The bottom of it, the only true ring of the endolarynx is the cricoid. Signet ring shape, big and back, small in front. So when you see that whole ring, when you're looking down lower at the larynx, you know you're at the level of the cricoid and there shouldn't be anything on the inside of the cricoid. We shouldn't see any mucosal thickening or stuff around there, that's right. Good job. Okay, Grace? Yep. All right, um, so we have a coronal CT um, of the temporal bone and, um, and we see, you know, widening of the um, jugular foramen um, and uh, I'm not really seeing like permeated periosteal changes. I'm not really seeing, it's more of a smooth endosteal kind of get scalloping. Um, so I'm thinking based on the bony changes, I'm thinking that there might be a schwannoma hiding in there based on the osseous changes. And what do you think about the bird head? Um, I think it's not there. It's gone. Well, ah. the, the, the beak is gone. Oh, the this beak is, the is beak. gone. Okay, so maybe it's a hypoglossal schwannoma that's well, no, that's going to come out over the bottom. You, you were right the first time. So that uh, is just, regular schwannoma that's eaten. Every so day. You, you, uh, anything you want to ask clinically? Um, any sort of cranial nerve deficits or symptoms or? Yeah, he said he thinks the ninth nerve is out. Does that mean that this arises from the ninth nerve? Not necessarily, because um, no. there, there are three nerves in the jugular foramen, so it could arise from any of them. It what could just be nerves? pressing on it. What are those nerves? Um, 9, 10, 11. So if cranial nerve 9 is out, does that mean that, that 9 is the nerve this tumor arises from? Not necessarily. It could be pushing on it from a different schwannoma. Because some cranial nerves are more sensitive to external compression than others are to internal derangement. 
So just yes. because one cranial nerve is out does not mean that that's the cranial nerve that your tumor is actually arising from. Yep. Okay. Good job. Uh, okay. Let's see, April. Okay. All right, so coronal T2 and T1 post images. Kind of through the level of the cochlea, I guess. Um, so we have a, a T2 ISO, T1 um, hyper, you know, maybe enhancing lesion. That's, we're kind of like at the level of the temporal horns. That is um, asymmetric on the left, adjacent to the medial temporal horn. So I think, yep, there. I'm trying to decide if I think we're like truly at the level of the cavernous sinus or if we're in the ambient cisterns. Well, what is this thing? That thing is like probably the pia around the temporal horn. It's like the tentorium. The tentorium. Oh, okay. We're back far. Okay. So we're if we're just back coming back. out in front of the pons, okay. What are what are all these dots? These nerves fibers here. What's a big yeah. nerve that comes out of the pons on both sides? So that would be V five, or a V oh. uh, uh, cranial nerve five. Okay, so if all if those are all the fibers of five, what are we at the level of? So we're at the level of basically the CPA. The trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave, where all those fibers are coming out. Okay. And kind of the prepontine cistern, if, if those are the verts going up to the basal or something like that, we're at about that level. Okay. okay. So you have an avidly enhancing lesion. Yeah. So avidly enhancing extraaxial lesions, I'm thinking. Um, always thinking meningioma. Um, I'm also thinking, could this be a nerve sheath tumor uh, related to V5? Or I'm sorry, to the fifth cranial nerve. That's the same second time I've said that. Um, could this potentially be perineural spread that is going like backwards? Uh, I don't think so. I think this would be a bad set of sequences to show that diagnosis. Um, so I would say- The Q2 signal is what? ISO. It's kind brain. of ISO brain. Yeah. And I think it probably enhances, although we don't have it. I have it right. Good point. Yeah. So I would say um, maybe meningioma versus schwannoma. So if I showed you a coronal mm -hmm. and the vector of spread was really forward and back, that would support a nerve sheath tumor kind of thing. Yeah. But if this is just dural base with dural tails avidly enhancing extraaxial mass, then just an uh, meninge. Then just a meninge. Good. This is a meninge. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Christian? All right. So. I'm looking at a, I think it's a Sagitta T1 post through the clivus. Not 100% sure. I think it's. It's hard. That's really zoomed in. This is an uh, acne, and this okay. is kind of a sagittal. This is the cerebellum folia. This, um, then. Oh, is this just a T bone? It's like a T bone. That's right. So it's, okay. it, it's axial and sagittal, T1 post contrasted. Yeah. Okay. So, so I do see the fascia nerve. So the the, um, the actual picture shows the fascia nerve. There's enhancement of the genu, um, but also of the labyrinthic and the tympanic segments. And I think they are not supposed to enhance. So that's abnormal. I'm thinking about a yeah. The cisternal segment should not enhance. It is normal to see some enhancement of the facial nerve. You can see it at the genicular ganglion, then the tympanic segment, then the labyrinthine segment less commonly, and then the mastoid less commonly like that. But you shouldn't see an enhancement all the way along the nerve. And we don't see the enhancement in the cisternal segments of, of the cranial nerves. So where is this enhancement here? Um, 
So what is what is that thing? Uh, the internal acoustic canal. The IAC. So we have enhancement in the IAC. So that's abnormal. So you have enhancement all the way along the course of the nerve, and there's a tuft of enhancement within the IAC laterally. So yeah, I think about the Bell's palsy. A herpetic or a Bell's palsy. That's great. Do you normally image herpetic or Bell's palsies at your shop? Mm. I think we do it to rule out other etiologies. I can give you that. Like what? Like a, a, any sort of a mass that can push on it. Um, maybe like trauma related, post traumatic. Where does the facial nerve open up? In the styloid foramen. The stylo. Mastoid. Stylo mastoid foramen. And then it goes into the what? In the parotid. In the parotid gland, and then it bifurcates. Anything in the parotid that may make you think about pathology along the facial nerve? So, like a carcinoma that has spread along the facial nerve. Perineal uh, tumor spread. So if you have a minor salivary gland carcinoma, especially in the parotid, we want to think about minor salivary gland carcinomas and look at that area and be sure that it is going up. Uh, so this is a good appearance for a herpetic or a Bell's palsy. You have avid enhancement all the way along the course of the nerve and you have a tuft in the lateral IC, but you always want to differentiate that from a perineal tumor spread, like if you have an adenoid cystic in the parotid itself, right? Yeah, and that would enlarge the nerve, I think, while the Bell's palsy does not. Reduce the canal, right? So on a hepatic or Bell's palsy, what would you expect to find on the CT? I would see a mass in the parotid. Um, I would see um, enlargement of the fascia canal. With what? The microphone. Uh, the um, stylomastoid foramen would be enlarged. It's enlarged with what pathology and, and without what? With the perineural tumor spread. It with would cancer, be enlarged. you could enlarge uh, the canal. So if a patient has a herpetic or a Bell's palsy, what do you see on CT? I think you wouldn't see anything. Normal. The canal's normal on CT with a herpetic or Bell's palsy, but you see avid enhancement all the way along its course. So normally we would not image a herpetic or Bell's palsy. It should be obvious clinically what's going on with that patient. But if it doesn't go away, then we wanna think about something else. So a herpetic or a Bell's palsy, especially if you work at a cancer hospital, is not a herpetic or Bell's palsy until it goes away. Until it goes away, we need to look at the parotid and be sure we don't have perineal tumor spread or something else going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that tuft of enhancement in the IAC, would that, would that not point us more towards a neoplastic cause or, or is that- yeah, Classic specifically for a herpetic or a Bell's palsy. You can see that expanded. The lateral IAC is what you see. So the okay. other big differential, what if you had a vesicular rash on the ear and this appears? Well, well, you can have like, um, like a, sorry, um, shingles. It's like shingles. Um, varicella type of. Like varicella, a herpes zoster oticus or Ramsey Hunt for Dr. Weintraub likes to name stuff after dead people. So herpes zoster oticus, you have avid enhancement all the way along the nerve, but usually it's more linear in the IC rather than a tuft like a herpetic. But they have a, a vesicular red rash on the pen of their ear if you have a herpes zoster oticus or Ramsey Hunt, if you have that infection, kind of like varicella or shingles of a different type. Got it. Thank you. Good. Okay. Tyler? Dr. Wiggins, could you show the cause of the nerve on the sagittal? I'm not so oriented on that picture. Oh, sorry. It is, it is kind of unusual. That's a, a weird kind of oblique sagittal. Uh, but you have the internal auditory canal here. Mm -hmm. So you have a cisternal segment, a canalicular segment, a labyrinthine segment to the geniculate ganglion. That's where the greater superficial vitrosal nerve, parasympathetic fibers, come off. And it goes immediately lateral to the carotid. The sympathetic fibers from the carotid join those parasympathetic fibers from seven and together they form the long, thin, curvilinear pterygoid or vidian canal. 
the rest of the fibers of seven go back under the lateral semicircular canal of the vestibule. That's the tympanic segment to the posterior genu. And then from the posterior genu, you have the descending or mastoid segment that goes down to come out that hole in the head in between the styloid and the mastoid process called the stylomastoid foramen. Then it goes forward to the parotid and splits in that pes and serenus, mm -hmm. temporal, zygomatic, mandibular, buccal, cervical, occipital branch. And all that enhancement is just a gland? Uh, this one I think is actually not fat saturated. So it's a little tricky out there. But the important thing here is that you're seeing avid enhancement all the way along the nerve. Yeah. And then that tuft laterally in the IAC. Okay, good, thank you. Good. Okay, Tyler? All right, it's here in anterior to the IAC. Or we just, I mean, let's see, to the IAC. I feel like we were just talking about this. Are we referring to those um, parasympathetic fibers that come off anteriorly that go to the form the Vidian canal? So it'd be facial? So in the IAC, if you think about the internal auditory canal. Oh, sorry, uh, I was, yeah. And you see four dots uh, that are kind of in there. And if, if the cerebellum is in the back, if this is the cerebellum, so you know that's posterior. So that's anterior, that's superior, and that's inferior. Yeah, I still think it's facial, um, but okay. yeah, I was Where totally thinking of the wrong spot. I was thinking of internal carotid artery. ICA and IAC, they're very close. Where does the facial nerve go from the IAC? Um, so part of it goes through the temporal bone, just like we were discussing. And then the segment that it goes to? Uh, from the IAC. So um, uh, we just talked about it. We did. So, <laughs> It goes to the labyrinthian segment. The labyrinthian segment, that's right. Where does the cochlear nerve go? Uh, to the cochlea. Touche. And what's in the middle of the cochlea? Um, so there's down humbling. around the cochlea and there's a oh, some the cochlear nerve canal. And there's this bow tie in the middle of the cochlea. What's that? Yeah, I'm blanking on the name. That's the modialis. Where does the superior vestibular nerve go? Uh, I, this would be kind of a guess. Does it go to the semicircular canals? Part of it goes. There's three different branches that the superior vestibular divide up into. You know what those are? I don't. There's a utricular nerve, there's a superior semicircular canal ampullary nerve, and there's a lateral semicircular canal ampullary nerve. So we think about the vestibule and the semicircular canals that come off, right? Do you know that part? Uh, the vestibule? So the vestibule is made up of two parts. There's a utricle up high and a saccule down low. And each of the semicircular canals has a swelling or ampulla where we think about the little otoliths the little crystals or stones within them. So there's a utricular nerve, a superior semicircular canal ampullary nerve, and a lateral semicircular canal ampullary nerve that all come off the superior vestibular nerve. And they all go through the superior vestibular canal, a little canal that is up high at the level of the vestibule. So what are the distal branches of the inferior vestibular nerve? Uh, I'm not sure. Good job. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's, I, I, don't, I don't expect you to know everybody. And literally, <laughs> nobody knows this. There's, there's, a, a, uh, there's a little saccular nerve, and there's a posterior semicircular canal ampullary nerve that are the distal branches of the inferior vestibular nerve. So there's five distal branches that come off the superior and the inferior vestibular canal. The superior vestibular nerve goes through the superior nerve canal, and then there's an inferior vestibular canal and a little singular canal that comes off the back of the IAC and goes over towards the back of the vestibule at that level. So those are where those nerves go distally. Does that make sense? 
<laughs> a lot to digest, but uh, thank There's you for the walkthrough. There's branches to that superior and inferior vestibular canal. Yeah. And what'd you say, Dr. Wiggins, goes through the singular canal? The uh, little posterior semicircular canal ampullary nerve goes through the singular canal and the saccular nerve goes through the inferior vestibular canal. If you ever look closely at a temporal bone IC and look laterally at the interlauditory canal on the axials, you can actually see these little channels out laterally. So next time we're looking at a temporal bone together, ask me and I'll point it out. Okay. See, that was Tyler. So back to Michael. Okay. There are multiple um, enlarged centrally necrotic uh, level two lymph nodes on the left uh, with adjacent um, stranding. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, metastatic lymph nodes. Uh, from, that would um, be a good story for that. Uh, most likely um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, of the um, uh, nasopharynx or um, so the thyroid. The strings to the parotid? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. No, no. What no. um, drains to the parotid? Oh, uh, uh, ear, external ear cancer. The henna of the ear and the periricular skin, the first nodal order drainage station is the parotid. The mm -hmm. nasopharynx we just talked about drains in the retropharyngeal nodes. The first nodal order drainage station for nasopharyngeal carcinoma is what? No, retropharyngeal nodes. Retropharyngeal nodes. What is the first nodal order drainage station of the pinna of the ear and the periricular skin? Uh, parotid nodes. The parotid. The parotid may have 50 to 60 lymph nodes in it. There's a whole bunch of lymph nodes in the parotid. Uh, so this guy did not have this, this, uh, that history. Is clinical history important? Yes. Would you like to know some clinical history? Yes, please. So that's a big deal, right? If I tell you this guy had a squame resected from the pin of his ear a year ago, then you think what? Uh, I'm thinking uh, metastatic spread. Lymph nodes in the parotid. What if I tell you this is an older woman with dry eyes and mouth? And I'm thinking Sicka syndrome, Sjogren. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what if I tell you this is an HIV patient who hasn't been on the triretroviral drugs? Uh, Lymphoproliferative or... Um, Lymphoid, uh, the cysts. Cyst. Uh, Sometimes huh? call them the HIV associated lymphoepithelial cysts. Yeah. What if this is an older smoker at the VA with bilateral parotid masses? Uh, then I'm thinking Worthens. Worthens or papillary cyst adenolymphomatosa. Worthens easier to say. So that's a very different story, right, from the clinical. I had a squam resected from the ear. It's an older woman with dry eyes and mouth. It's an HIV positive patient, or it's an older smoker at the VA. We're going to think very different things for this differential, right? Yeah. That we have cystic, multiple cystic lesions in the parotid. Uh, in whichever story I tell you, you're going to go in that different direction, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Matthew? What did that end up being? And does it bother you that it's not, uh, that it's not symmetric? No, I feel like the slices are perfectly a little different. symmetric like you. Uh, yeah. No, it can be bilateral, or unilateral, multicentric, or unicentric. This is papillary cyst adenolymphomatosum or Worthens. Where it gets really tricky is when you put a needle in it, you might just get old blood. A lot of people think that that's non diagnostic, but in reality, if you get old blood in it, that may be telling you the diagnosis it's Worthens because Worthens have old blood. Because of that old blood at different stages of blood, it may look very malignant looking on MR. And it often shows up in the parotid tail, kind of as, as an angle of the mandible mass. Okay, uh, Matthew. All right, top left is a T2 MR at the level of the pons, looking at a lesion in adjacent to the left uh, ICA. 
possibly in um, the trigeminal uh, trigeminal uh, cave, <laughs> Meckel's cave. So the ICA is going through the trigeminal cave there. No, it's it's adjacent to it though. No. I guess it could be cavernous sinus, but cavernous sinus. Okay. Um, it looks like it's T1 dark with some heterogeneous enhancement and is diffusion restricting. Huh. It's not in the Petrus apex, is it? It doesn't look like it is. Are you the one asking questions here? Yeah, sorry. No, let's say it's at the cavernous sinus. We're above the petrous apex. Yeah. Um, but that bone is going to be lower. When I see the diffusion restriction and, and the TT signal, I am thinking something like an epidermoid cyst, but I, I don't think of them in the um, cavernous sinus. No, we don't do that. But yeah, that's a great thought, epidermoid. So in the cavernous sinus, what do you think about normally being there? Uh, nerve, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, maybe a meningioma if it's extending from the dura. Right. So um, it, what is normally in the cavernous sinuses? All right, you got the internal carotid artery. Right. You have uh, three, four, uh, five, one, five, two, and, and um, six. So V1 and V2, we think about going down the wall. The most medial object is a carotid. The most medial nerve is six. It should be right next to the carotid. And what, what else is, is in the cavernous sinuses? They're made up of what? Venous plexus. Valveless venous sinusoids that are going on. Every now and then though, we see other stuff, especially on imaging. What would you think if you saw fat in the cavernous sinus? Um, I don't know, like a fat graft after a surgery. You might think about that. You're actually allowed to have some fat in the cavernous sinus. What if you saw dots of air in the cavernous sinus? Um, tech, we got teched. So IV connecting, you know, so we have some reflux power injectors, the air gets sent back up. So you're allowed to have little dots of air in the cavernous sinus. That could be confusing also. So yeah, this thing is actually not enhancing. It looks like it's kind of fluid. So what if it, it followed CSF on all sequences and did not restrict on diffusion? If it didn't restrict and it followed CSF, it'd be like an arachnoid cyst. Right, but because it's bright on the diff and dark in the ADC, this is a- Epidermoid. Epidermoid cyst. What if this exact same thing is in the middle ear cavity? Epidermoid. And, and what do we call the things no, that look like epidermoid cysts, but except it's centered in the middle ear cavity? If it's in the middle ear, it's a cholesteatoma. We think about a cholesteatoma, right, good job. Uh, Grace? All right, um, so we have an axial CP and we have a coronal CP. It looks like um, and we're centered, centered at the right orbit. Um, so there is um, some mucosal thickening of the um, ethmoid air cells and also in the um, superior aspect of the right maxillary sinus, there is a small periosteal um, abscess within the right um, orbit along the medial margin, and it's displacing the medial rectus muscle laterally, and there's a small amount of um, fluid in the orbit as well as and fat straining. Um, it's predominantly extraclonal and um, retral bulbar. So uh, it's concerning for... The other name of spaces that we talk about around the orbit. Sorry, what? What is the other names of spaces that we talk about around the eyeball? Oh, um, well, we like saying like intraconal and extraconal. Right, and pre bulbar and retro bulbar. What's the right. other one? Oh, pre preceptal and postseptal. Right. And this is? This would be postseptal. And what is? Oh, the... That's the septum. And what is the septum? Um, it's the, it's a, extension of the periosteum. A reflection of periosteum that comes off the medial lateral walls of the orbit and connects to the <laughs> plate, the little bit of cartilage that's in your eyelid. Right. Um, so this is highly concerning to me for in like a, a sinusitis with um, infection into the orbit. Yeah. 
But what if there was just a lot of mass right here at this location? A lot of mass oh. to destroy bone. Oh, um, are we talking about like maybe a maxillary uh, squamous cell carcinoma, potentially? Right, and what might it be crawling along right there? Um, oh shoot, uh, that would be, I don't, I don't remember. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull my I don't know card. There's one thing up here, there's one thing down here, and there's one thing that comes out the mandible. Oh, the inferior orbital fissure? Inferior orbital fissure, and what nerve goes through there? Um, so that would be V2. That's V2. Like, what, what do you think this is? Is that an old fracture? Um, I do not think that's an old fracture. You don't? No. Well, is it normal to have a little divot right there? Um, I, I'm going to go with, I, I think it is normal. And now I'm starting to think it's not normal, but I think it's normal. Um, if it's you normal. look where the optic nerve hits the eyeball, right at yeah. that level on the coronal, there's always a little divot in the medial wall right there. That's okay. the inferior ethmoid artery canal. So that's gotcha. what that is right there. So we think about that as a potential route of spread from the eyeball into the ethmoids or from the ethmoids into the orbit along, the, uh, along those arteries, the anterior ethmoid artery canal. So if there's air above that canal, we sometimes say the canal is low hanging. Some right. people like fancy words. It's suspended on an osseous mesentery. Okay. <laughs> but it, the surgeons just say it's low hanging. So around the paranasal sinuses, when we're thinking about FEZ, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, we sometimes have important surgical checkpoints that we talk about around that area. Do you know what those are? Um, well, there is a, uh, I think there's a mnemonic that you can, that I don't remember right now, but um, things that you want to look at, you want to look at the depth of the ol olfactory fossa with the, what's like the Caro's classification. Oh yeah, close. Nice. Uh, or closet. Closet. So the C is for what? Uh, the cribiform plate. And where is that? Um, that would be the, the bottom of the olfactory fossa. Like uh, the right there. The yes. So that's crystagalli. Yes. That's cribiform plate. Right. That's lateral lamella. And that's right. fulvia ethmoidalis is the roof. So right. we have that anatomy kind of around that area. So the olfactory bulbs are right there. And the, the uh, shared middle and superior turbinate goes up, the nasal septum goes down. So what's the air-filled space right there under the cribiform plate in between the midline nasal septum and the shared attachment of the superior and middle turbinate? Oh, um, I, I don't remember. That's the olfactory recess that we talked olfactory about. Olfactory recess, okay. And as you said, the Carroll's classification, we, we are talking about the cribiform plate, but what you're actually measuring is the lateral lamella. Is okay. it between zero and four, between four and eight, or over eight for the one, two, three of that? Carousel is for what? Uh, lamina papyracea. Lamina papyracea, so the medial wall. So there's an old fracture. If there's herniating fat uh, you know, that goes through there, the sinus guys will get all excited if they're going up the nose, and suddenly there's post-septal fat bat there. That could be exciting. So O is for what? Oh, I'm not sure. Is for onodi or other air cells, air cells okay. outside of their parent bone. So in the sagittal, if you're looking at the sphenoid, anytime there's ethmoid that aerates above the sphenoid, so if this is ethmoid and this is sphenoid on a sagittal, this is aerating above the sphenoid, so that counts as an onodi or a superior posterior ethmoid air cell. So S is for skull base. Sometimes it's very asymmetric. You see one side goes down and the other side may be very flat where the crystal is and the olfactory bulbs and the, the medial orbital gyri in that sulcus. So if one side is very high and you do surgery on that side first, you expect the other side to be the same, but you could quickly get into brain if you don't pay attention to that. So then E is for those ethmoid artery canals if they're low hanging, if there's air above it. And then T is for what? Um, is, that, is that like the, I'm not, I'm not sure. Oh, the tongue, the teeth, the teeth. Teeth. So teeth are often important, especially with the maxillary sinus, the idea of dental origin, osteomyelitis disease, where we have teeth roots that stick up into the maxillary sinus. That's one of the things that we think about. The idea of odontogenic origin of maxillary sinus disease is something that we look for. So maxillary sinus disease may be associated with teeth. That becomes a big deal sometimes because you can do all this surgery on the sinuses but you won't actually fix the problem until you go take care of the teeth. 
that make sense? Yep, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Okay, so that's a little after one. Do you guys want to do more for 20 minutes or so? Or you've had enough? Yeah, more. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, uh, after Grace, we got April. Yep. Okay, so we have axial and I think coronal images of the um, of the ear here. I'm looking at a soft tissue mass that looks like it's eroding the um, sputum in Prusak space. I'm wondering if this is a uh, cholesteatoma. So that's the sputum over there. It might be blunted a little bit, but where is most of this soft tissue? Um, most of it is in the um, epitympanum. Epitympanum. So when you see the ice cream cone, you're at the epitympanum. So yep. the ice cream scoop is what? Um, oh, gosh. Um, so uh, scoop is malleus, and I think malleus. cone is incus. And what is the ice cream cone? Incus is the short process of the incus, that's right. So we wanna see a nice ice cream cone, right? Everybody likes ice cream. When you see the ice cream cone, you're in the epitympanum, you're in the top. How do you divide the epitympanum and the mesotympanum? Based off of where the um, uh, eardrum is, the tympanic membrane, I think. So everything above that is- So the TM goes from the sputum to what? To the inferior part. I don't know what that's called. The cannulus is the bottom down low. Yes. Okay. So uh, the, yeah, this, I mean, this is the duck head. So what is the head of the duck? I don't know. The vestibule. What is the beak of the duck? I don't know. The lateral semicircular canal. What's going down to the neck of the duck? Um, is that co? Or we're not in cochlea, there, are we? Say that again, but without the knot. We are in cochlea there, aren't we? It's the basal turn of the cochlea. So this is the cochlear promontory that's over the cochlea, right? So this is the IAC out laterally. So just under the beak of the bird should be the facial nerve tympanic segment right there. So if you draw a line from the tip of the sputum to the tympanic segment, that separates the epitympanum uh, up on top from the mesotympanum, the middle of the middle ear cavity. So you have a soft tissue mass that's in the epitympanum. So what do you think about the ice cream cone over here? I mean, I think it looks all right. The soft tissue mass abuts it. Um, it's butting it. But look, it at, look at this ice cream cone and look at that ice cream cone. Um, it does not look all right. No, it does not look all right or no, I'm doing the wrong thing. No, no, it does not look all right. You are okay. correct. Um, Something yeah. is eating the ice cream cone. Yes. And it's eating the ice cream cone before the ice cream. Yes. That you know, doesn't have any would do that. Every little kid knows you have to eat the ice cream before the cone, right? Yes. You have a soft tissue mass in the middle ear cavity that's non-gravity dependent with some kind of osseous destruction, in this case, eating the cone. What do yeah. you think about that? I still think cholesterol. Yeah, far and away, 90% of the time, that's going to be a cholesteatoma. That's right in that area. So this is very complicated little anatomy kind of around that part and around that area. Does, it, does that anatomy make sense? Uh, it makes sense as you're describing it. Okay. What is this guy? Um, that's the vestibule. That's the vestibule. What is this guy? That is a semicircular circular canal lateral, I guess you're saying. A lateral semicircular canal, right? So what is this little segment right here? That's, um, is that facial nerve? That's a facial nerve, what segment? Mastoid, mastoid? Well, no, the mastoid goes through the mastoid ear cell, silly. Yeah, uh, tympanic, tympanic, I don't know. <laughs> It's this is the segment that goes through the labyrinthine part of the ear. The labyrinthine segment? The labyrinthine segment. Good job. So if we're looking at the labyrinthine segment, are we up high or are we down low in the IAC? I think we're up high. We're up high because the facial nerve is on top. 
So at that level, there's another little canal that comes off and goes back here towards the front of the vestibule. So this is the labyrinthine segment. So what is that? The geniculate. Well, no, the geniculate is up here. So the labyrinthine segment goes up to the geniculate. Greater superficial trosal comes off from there. And then the tympanic segment goes back. This is a little canal that's up high. It's at the level of the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, but it's going over towards the front of the vestibule. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. That's the superior vestibular canal that we were just talking about. So the superior vestibular nerve is up high and the facial nerve is up high. The facial nerve goes through the labyrinthine segment and the superior vestibular nerve goes through the superior vestibular canal to go over to the front of the vestibule. And it has three branches that we just talked about, right? Uh, yes. I'm not going to remember them. So the utricular nerve, the lateral semicircular canal, and the superior semicircular canal ampullary nerves are the three distal branches of the superior vestibular nerve. And they all go through that little canal. So that is the superior vestibular canal right there. Okay. So if you see a homogeneous soft tissue mass in the middle ear cavity with some kind of osseous destruction, 90% of the time it's a... Colesteatoma. Colesteatoma. Good job. Okay. Christian? So I'm looking at a lateral radiograph of the neck. There is thickening of the prevertebral soft tissues. Patient is intubated and has an enteric tube as well. And there's some like, like, like some density sitting in the middle of that uh, soft tissue swelling. Not sure what that is. Maybe a foreign Do you body. you think there's a little bit of soft tissue swelling here? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of soft tissue swelling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this guy is C2. So how do you talk about prevertebral soft tissue swelling? Do you like to measure things? Here to use an internal standard. Uh, I think it depends on the level. High up, it's, I don't remember quite, something with the vertebral body, maybe two thirds of the vertebral body. Is so the some people use like half a vertebral body at C2 and one and a half vertebral bodies below the hypopharyngeal shelf. Or if you like numbers, six at two and 22 at six is something you can remember. So where C2 is, you have about six millimeters normally of soft tissue in front of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then 22 at six, maybe 22 millimeters at the most in front of that. So this is a lot and you can see the tubes in there, the airway is going way down over there. So how do you differentiate prevertebral from retropharyngeal? I think it's an old guy who didn't have many teeth. What do you think about those calcifications you mentioned? That he swallowed like pieces of his... He could have swallowed something, but you know, just like they always say in the playing form world, one view is no view. Are there any things on the sides in old people that we sometimes see calcification in? Yeah. Oh, the oh, this is a calcification of the bifurcation of the carotid. Right. So sometimes we see calcification in the carotids out laterally to do that. Oh, so this is prevertebral because it's pushed forward. Well, no, it still could be either one because we know that the carotids can be pushed way out laterally if there's anything prevertebral or retropharyngeal. All right. So yeah, in this case, I'm thinking about an infection or a bleed, depending on the history. Okay. And anything else you might like to do to try to work it up? A CT. You'd like a CT? Mm -hmm. I would like to have a CT with contrast. No, I am. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I see a lot of contrast pooling in the, I think it's the retropharyngeal space, uh, in the retropharyngeal space, um, also like extending lateral. Uh, oh, so he's bleeding. He's bleeding from from somewhere. Um, bleeding? Why do you think he's bleeding? Because we gave him IV contrast, and he has all that stuff now in this retropharyngeal space. So 
Oh, it's like he got a, it's a traumatic two placement. That would be exciting. Whoops. Is there any other history you'd like to have? Uh, he was a very bad car accident. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> and why, why was he intubated? Was he intubated like on the scene or yeah, somebody a, plays a line? A really bad car wreck. So we think okay. about these different fascia layers, right? There's a prevertebral, a paravertebral fascia that goes around yeah. the vertebral bodies. And then there's the, the carotid sheath or space kind of on both sides that we think about around carotid vessels and the jug, right? There's a fascia yeah. that connects. And the left eye. We sometimes call it the alar fascia. Yeah. Right. So if this is prevertebral, and this is retropharyngeal. What is this? The prevertebral space. But what is in between the prevertebral space and the retropharyngeal space? Um, the the deep, the deep layer of the superficial fascia? Well, the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia is the prevertebral space. But what is the space that's in between the retropharyngeal space and the prevertebral space? It's kind of a dangerous space. Oh, the dangerous space. Oh, yeah. It's the dangerous T4. What are we talking no, about the dangerous space? So that's a potential space that extends inferiorly to the mediastinum. It's a potential continuous so We could have retropharyngeal yeah. abscess that goes down, or we could have and an abscess going up. An abscess. Like an infection that's going up. Yeah, with all this neck. Oh, so he's bleeding from a vessel in the in the chest. He's bleeding from a aorta? big vessel in the chest. There's a big vessel that comes off the heart and it kind of goes up and then it goes down. That, that sounds like the aorta. Like the aorta. It's so much like the aorta. You may even say it is the aorta. Yeah, so this is a case I actually checked on the scanner. I think it was back in the 90s. And I went to check it and the whole trauma team's around me. And this is the CT image that came up and I'm looking at it and I was going, what is all of this? I don't understand what is going on here. This, it looks like contrast, but it looks like there's contrast going up through the space. And I'm looking at it and I'm saying, how did contrast get in this space? And I looked up and I said, is this guy alive? And that little machine that goes beep was just making this flat noise. And then all the guys from the trauma team ran into the room and they started pushing on his chest and doing it. This is actually a traumatic aortic rupture with contrast going back up and that danger space in the retropharyngeal space. So it's obviously extremely rare. So it's going up. What? So he was lying down and that's it's going up? Or was it a- He was in the go up? theater, we were actively scanning him, but he had had a traumatic okay. aortic rupture with contrast leaking up. So he, he died right there while we were doing uh, the CT scan. Oh, okay. Fortunately, we got the CT before he died. <laughs> oh, God. Good. Okay, uh, let's see, Tyler left. All right, back to you, Michael. Okay, um, looking at a coronal uh, T2 through the orbits, uh, there's a bilateral thickening of the uh, extra ocular muscles, particularly medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus, and superior oblique. Uh, so I'm thinking this is Graves orbitopathy. Right. So that's a good appearance for a thyroid orthopathy. The fat is also a little prominent around there. But anytime his eyeballs are trying to escape the skull, you have two big questions, right? Does it hurt and is it acute? Right, good job. Okay. 
Let's see, Matthew? Short term memory? Here. Uh, it's going to be a normal CT and maybe a normal MRI, but definitely a normal CT. Well, what do you expect to see on MRI if you have a herpetic or a Bell's palsy? There should be, there could be enhancements of the um, facial nerve. There could be, or there is? There is. There is. There's avid enhancement along the facial nerve. And what else? The intertemporal facial nerve. Um, I don't know. And the, and the inter, internal auditory canal portion of the facial nerve. There's a tuft of enhancement laterally in the IAC and avid enhancement all the way along the course of the nerve. So depending on your scanners, if you're doing a lot of 3T or only one and a half, you might see a lot of enhancement of the facial nerve. About two thirds of the patients will have some enhancement on at least one segment, and about two thirds of those will be asymmetric. So it may not be symmetric one side or the other. With a herpetic or a Bell's palsy, you see avid enhancement all the way along the intertemporal course of the nerve with a tuft of enhancement out laterally. What if you see enhancement along the nerve and the guy's got a vesicular red rash on the pin of his ear? Uh, then he just call it. Or is that herpes? That's herpes zoster. Yeah, that's that's the herpes zoster oticus or Ramsey Hunt syndrome to Dr. Weintraub. What if he has a mass in his parotid and he has avid enhancement along his facial nerve? A parent paratumoral spread. Then you think about perineal tumor spread. What pathology really likes to have perineal tumor spread? Famous cell carcinoma and um, the cystic. Yeah, yeah, pathology really likes to have perineal tumor spread. What, what uh, pathology do we see the most perineural tumor spread with? Um, I think we see it most with SCC because SCC is the most common. Far and away the most common head neck cancer. So most of perineural tumor spread we see is with squame just because we see so many more squame than we do with anything else. But adenoid cystic as a pathology really likes perineural tumor spread. Good, uh, Grace? All right, um, we have an axial MRI of the head. It looks like it's a T1 post contrast exam. Um, there is asymmetric enhancement um, within the orbits and we see also asymmetric enlargement of the cavernous sinus on the left. Right. Um, and those are kind of the main findings that's sticking out to me right now. So um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I don't think there's anything else. Um, so I guess the things that I'm thinking about, um, could this be like, um, so things in the cavernous sinus, um, uh, since there's asymmetric enlargement and enhancement, could there be like, it, could this be an IOID kind of thing? Like, um, uh, could this be like- uh, Just the cavernous sinus? Yeah, so I think there's enlargement of the cavernous sinus. From? So what's this? Uh, into the, there's also, ex, oh, okay, yeah, there's also abnormal enhancement into the superior orbital fissure. What's the fissure that's below the superorbital fissure? The inferior orbital fissure. Orbital fissure. And what is this <laughs> enhancement back here? Um, oh, okay, yeah, so there's, Enhancement in the cavernous sinus, and then also, oh wow, okay, never mind. Okay, so this, there's enhancement extending through. There's ex enhancement extending posteriorly from the cavernous sinus and extending to the brainstem. So it looks like there's enhancement all along that nerve. Um, so this would be the sixth cranial nerve, is what I'm thinking. Well, six comes out anteriorly at the pontomedullary. Oh no, 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 no. So. This is the, the, the V2 nerve, um, trigeminal, and then it's going through the cavernous sinus, and then it's going through the inferior orbital fissure. So this is V2. So this is the inferior orbital fissure. Yeah. And this is the? That is the cavernous sinus. Right. And this is the? Meckel's cave. The trigeminal cistern or Meckel's cave. And this kind of cistern in front of the pons is the? Cisternal segment of the? Um, Trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve. So you should have those big fibers of five spreading out, kind of going right there. And as you said, this is enhancement within the brain. 
So this yeah. is perineal tumor spread that's gone all the way back and touched the brain. Right. This is your job to see this because it's hard to palpate back there, right? Yeah, very hard. But it's our job to tell them whether perineal tumor spread because if the perineal tumor spread goes all the way back and touches the brain, he's probably not a very good surgical candidate anymore. Probably not. Even with a big facectomy, you're not going to be able to cut off all of this tumor enough to change this guy's morbidity and mortality, right? Right. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Good. So where would you guess this guy's primary tumor was? Uh, hmm. Okay, so it's going along V2. I'm wondering, could this be like maxillary sinus? Could be. And what's in front of the maxillary sinus? It could be premalar, potentially. The skin. So we could have a skin squame on your cheek. Oh, okay. Gotcha. The skin squame under the eyeball. So far and away, the most common head and neck cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. And usually we're talking about skin or upper digestive tract. And if we're talking about skin, we're often thinking about perineal tumor spread, less rarely you see nodes. If we're talking about upper digestive tract, we're usually looking at nodes and less commonly perineal tumor spread. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, April? Okay, so we have an axial MRI. It looks like it probably is a T, T1 post, I would imagine, with SATSAT. -sat. Good imagination. Um, okay. So... I'm trying to <clears throat> I'm not really seeing um, a definite abnormality. There is some asymmetry on <laughs> the yeah, so there's some I think that's um like the head of the uh, mandible, but I don't really see it this, on the this other. This is the side. mandible. That's mandible. Oh, right. What's this? Um, What's medial muscle? to the mandible? Muscle. What muscle? Digastric. Well, the, there's an interbelly digastric. Oh, it's under ma masticator. Masticator. This is the posterior belly right here. Yeah, masticator. I'm sorry. So the I on the masticator. That's lateral to the mandible. What is the muscle that goes from the mandible and connects over to the medial pterygoid plate? the medial, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. It's a muscle that comes off the medial pterygoid plate and goes off over to the mandible. The medial pterygoid? Medial pterygoid, touche, good job. So that's the medial pterygoid and that's the masseter and that's the mandible in between. And so what is this? That's parotid. Parotids, that's the parotid space, mostly the parotid gland. What is this space up here? A masticator space. Masticator space. What is this space back here? Carotid. The carotid. So we have the carotid in the jug here. Then you have the oral mucosal kind of surface or space around this. So we've got oral cavity up here. You know, we have those circumvelli papillae, the bumps on the back. So this stuff is oral pharynx. You have the uh, palatine tonsils or fascial tonsils on both sides. This is your soft palate and your uvula, the thing that hangs down in the back of your throat, right? Yeah, so I'm seeing what on do you the, think about uh, the masticator space and the parotid space over here. Yeah, so um, there is a enhancing lesion um, that looks like it is centered at the in the bone um, with cortical destruction and a big soft tissue component. Um, now, is there normally a hole around that area? No. What's your second guess? Yes. What is that hole? Um, I'm not sure. It's not the superior alveolar foramen. The inferior alveolar foramen. <laughs> alveolar foramen. So we have a branch uh, that comes out through a valley and there's a nerve that comes down. It divides in an anterior and a posterior branch. And yes. the posterior branch goes over there. And there's this little tongue of bone called the lingula 
and then it goes through the mandible to come out this mental foramen uh, anteriorly in the mandible. Yeah. So uh, back here, there's a mastoid tip and there's a little styloid process. What comes out in between those? So that's the styloid mastoid foramen. Styloid mastoid foramen. And what uh, comes out there? Facial nerve. The facial nerve. So he has all these branches as he goes through the parotid, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Zanzibar with something. I forget if you use the two Zanzibar monitor. by motor car, you leave off the occipital branch. But yeah, those are the branches of the parotid. Temporal, zygomatic, mandibular, buccal, cervical, and occipital. So we have V3 that goes through ovale mm -hmm. and then splits and its division is supposed to go over. And then we have seven out here laterally. Is there any place around there where five and seven come together? Yes. What is that? Um, I'm, I don't know. Good, so there's an auricular temporal branch. There's a nerve that connects those two, okay? So based on our last several cases and based on that anatomy, what do you guess is going on over here? Uh, perineural tumor spread of tumor through like a V5 and this auricular nerve. So parotid slash like cranial nerve seven via the parotid and V3 as right. well. So this was a tumor that was in the parotid and it got on the auricular temporal nerve. It went over here and connected to V3 below a valley. And then it got on V3 and went into the mandible. So that's that perineural tumor spread of an auricular temporal nerve. So this is kind of transspatial, it's two spaces. That's the masticator space and that's the parotid space back behind it. So there's a connection kind of between those spaces in that sense. Does that make sense? Yes. So we had a tumor that started in the parotid, it got on the auricular temporal, it went over to V3, and then it went along V3 to go into the mandible. Yeah. So that's a lesion that's in the masticator space and there's a lesion in the parotid space. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, let's see, after April is Christian. Okay. Oh, I know that one. Oh, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> you're supposed to enjoy the ones you said, drag it out. Okay. Let's Play the console. game. The knowledge, okay. Yeah. So I'm looking at a carotid angiogram on the left and the actual T1 image on the, on the right. So there's a vascular mass in the bifurcation of the carotid. Uh, on the MRI image, there are flow voids that correlate with those, yeah, the vessels that you see on the angiogram. Um, so yeah, this is a mess in the carotid space, um, a different as a, a paraganglioma, a colomus, a carotid body paraganglioma. A glomus megali? A carotid body paraganglioma. Carotid body tumor. So if it's centered at the carotid body and it splays the ECA and the ICA with the flow voids, the salt and pepper appearance in the carotid cheese, but that is a carotid body tumor, not a glomus vagali. The glomus vagali is centered two centimeters below the skull base. So that's gonna be centered up here higher at a higher level, right? Right, yeah. What is this? That is a muscle. Good. Um... The lateral pterygoid? No. Nope. We're at the medial pterygoid and the masseter right here. The lateral pterygoid is up higher. It goes from the condylar neck over to the lateral pterygoid. So what is this space? Parotid space. What is this space? The carotid space. Carotid space. What, so what is this thing that's going in between separating the parotid and the carotid spaces? 
That is the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. Posterior belly digastric muscle. That muscle is important because it separates those two spaces. How you mentioned earlier, how it's displaced sometimes helps us guess where it arises from. If you see a carotid body tumor on one side, where, where do you look after you see that? On the contralateral side, because they are commonly bilateral. So 10 to 15%, maybe not common, but every now and then we do the, see them. Sometimes that are bilateral. And there's a genetic predisposition. Some people just have a bunch of paragangliomas. There's a familial history. Sometimes other people in the family, so we might screen other people. And we get in all these discussions about MEN syndromes and all these other things that the patient may get sonic hedgehog and all this other stuff that we may discuss in those cases. Uh, how big is a normal carotid body? One centimeter. Uh, six millimeters is what, what we found years ago. We looked at a whole bunch of normal CTs, CTAs of the neck, and we decided that six millimeters was uh, the cutoff for normal. If it's more than six millimeters, we might be uh, suspicious of a small carotid body tumor uh, there in that case. Okay, good job, guys. So, so I think Tyler left, so we will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Wiggins. Thank you, Dr. Wiggins. This was thank you very much. Two thumbs up. Oh, well, thank you. You're getting much better. I think the oh. has been taken from my hand. Maybe I have nothing left to teach you guys. Oh, you still have plenty to teach us. Yeah, what about the brain? Are we going to have a session? The brain is not interesting. You know, it's, it's not like the stuff in the temporal lobe is that different than the stuff that happens in the frontal lobe. But the head and neck, that part's interesting because there's all these different things all over the place. Okay. Sounds good. I'm sure you're okay. fine. Okay, thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you.